Thank you for uh, having me. I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to talk about what I'm doing now and a little bit of background with uh, One Laptop Per Child and the $100 Laptop, and then kind of wrap it up and briefly what I think it spells for the future of learning. I think that will be well represented on the panel. I'm the token hardware person, really. I, I do software too, but really am known for hardware innovation. And so I think there's, a, I left One Laptop Per Child four, four and a half years ago because I was frustrated with the lack of innovation in hardware, and I didn't think there were enough PhDs sleeping on the factory floors of the world, so that's what I do. Um, and we're using the excess capacity of the highest volume lines in uh, the LCD fabs, the liquid crystal display fabs in the world, to try to transform computing. You think, huh, display? Why transform computing? Um, uh, this is Raspberry Pi, the chairman of Raspberry Pi is here. This is a computer these days, this is 25 bucks, this is an Android one. Um, they're really small. The most expensive component and most power hungry component in any device is the screen. And what came from the work that I did at One Laptop Per Child was really an understanding of in electronics, it's all about the power consumption of the device. And you're sitting here in, in Cambridge, England, thinking, well, why on earth would I care about power? My iPad lasts 10 hours. I'm good. Um, in, in iPad 3 is a 9-watt machine. 8 watts of that goes to the screen. We designed, you know, seven years ago, the first 1-watt laptop. That matters more in the developing world because there aren't power outlets in the wall. Or if there are, they're on maybe a couple of hours a day. It takes seven hours to recharge an iPad. Seven hours. It could take two days on solar or longer if it's raining. And so really if you, you know, innovation, part of innovation comes from problem ownership. And the developing world owns a lot of problems. And so when you work there, you realize, you know, they really have to have it to transform their economies, their education. And anybody I've talked to in the rich world, um, you ask a single question, do you want your batteries to last longer or not so long? There's, there's really only one answer to that question. So we're the first company that have, have gotten access to this massive excess capacity. The landscape in Asia right now, everybody knows Apple's done very well. The story that's not really told is how poorly all the other device makers are doing. HP, Dell, Nokia, RIM makes the BlackBerry, Motorola went bankrupt, Google bottom, um, Asus, Acer, Lenovo are all living at zero or negative margins. You can only do that for so long. Even worse, the, the companies supplying the cutting edge components have been living at negative 20% margin for a number of years. And so the supply train has been bled completely dry for some geopolitical issues as well. I know this is about education, so bear with me. There's a point to what I'm taking. So, so, you know, is the world, does Apple win, eat, eat the world, and we all live through Apple devices? God help us, because they'll control the data stream and make, you know, 30 points on, on everything that comes through. And we've lost the diversity of, of hardware and of devices over the last few years. And so I'm working on, I believe, you know, you look at a tablet or a cell phone, it's pretty much a screen with this as a motherboard and batteries. And so if you get rid of the batteries and embed this into the screen, all you really need, the future of devices, is the screen with a small Wi-Fi chip. The screen can see, feel, touch. We're talking about screens with embedded touch into the back plane and uh, you know, uh, uh, cameras and know where your eyes are and changes the interaction. And so, and doesn't need any cables, no power, no data. So that changes what devices can be and can influence what everybody on the panel is doing when they're going to talk to you about the learning and the content and the software and, and so forth. We're working on, on you know, the information delivery device, right? What does that become? And to solve the developing world problem, we have to solve the power problem. And so the benefit is the developed world also gets that. So, We've shipped several million units, um, and we're, you know, going profitable, and things are pretty good, and we're going mainstream in soon, um, as as some of our partners actually are able to field 
devices that compete with Apple. But now I'll sort of segue and talk to you about this thing. This is a $100 laptop, and I uh, um, actually was a professor at MIT, so I very much understand the academic thinking. And uh, my mother was, did, wanted to disown me when I left MIT to sort of sleep on the factory floors of the world to design what everybody thought would be a stripped down laptop. There's a lot of cool technology in this laptop. I mentioned it's the lowest power laptop ever made. You can also drop it on the floor, um, spill on it, dunk it. And it, you know, it lasts, the batteries last a really long time. And it's transformed, really, educational opportunities for, you know, half of the children in the world is, is we're really talking about in that, you know, we throw away half the children that are born in the world today in that they don't get what any of us in this room would remotely consider to be an adequate education. And if you look at a developing world country, a sub-Saharan country in Africa, a typical, and I'm not going to name the country, but a large one, you know, a third of the teachers that are paid to show up don't show up. The next third are illiterate. And so you're dealing with one third of the teachers that actually show up and are illiterate. And the LDCs have been the most embracing of this program because the teacher, I mean, you go to sixth grade and you're done if you're lucky. And that's the rich kids. Um, now some of the work that One Laptop Per Child is doing is with the really poor kids, the ones that don't get to go to school. There's 100 million kids in the world that don't get to go to school. Another 100 million drop out before second grade. There's a billion people living today that are illiterate. So can we make the devices easy enough to use where people can learn how to read? whatever language. Their opportunities will be radically transformed if they can learn how to read. And some of the first data on that is backed. One laptop per child airdropped actually tablets into two very remote villages in Ethiopia recently. And the first, couple, the first months of results are in. Kids um, figured out how to turn on these laptops, figured out how to power them up with a solar shack that they set up for them, and are actually now passing tests that show they recognize letters. These kids are learning English letter, Arabic, A, B, C, D. They learn the alphabet song, but does that mean they know what the letters are? So they're two months in, kids that have never, in villages that have no written language, can now recognize letters and pass tests that have one in 80,000 chance of passing um, from random guesses. Half the children are passing two months in. So that's a really good early indicator that we can transform literacy skip the schools and, and access that way. So that, that's, that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, I guess, you know, the vision, if one of the best books I've ever read on this is actually science fiction, Neil Stevenson, Diamond Age. I mean, I think that's a collective vision a lot of us share in how um, self-discovery can happen. Um, these orphan girls in China actually take over China because <laughs> no one thought they'd learn and they figured it all out. So, you know, I guess the question I put is, you know, Thomas Edison, when he invented the motion picture um, more than a century ago, said learning was going to be transformed now. Everybody was going to watch motion pictures and learn that way. Teachers were going to be over all history. It didn't happen. What's different now is the connectivity, the richness of the content, the work, the computers, um, the interactivity. And it feels like also, you know, historically, the projects that succeed are the ones that have the most people working on them. And there's just an incredible amount of, of work going on here, going on in the people in the panel that represent. And it seems like this is the moment. It's not the time to dip your toe into the pool of this. It's the time to dive in and figure out how to do it. It, it really seems like that. It's going to move fast. And I think I'm you know, Pretty impressed with what everybody's doing, and I'll, I'll leave it at that and let our other panelists go. Thank you. Thank you.